Remember the old interurban? How about the steam locomotive? Maybe even the streamliner will cause pangs of nostalgia. Come along with us as we visit a virtual time machine, the Illinois Railway Museum. Located in the northern Illinois town of Union, the Illinois Railway Museum, or IRM for short, is one of the finest rail transportation museums in the United States. The collection includes examples of electric traction, steam locomotives, and diesels. One of the big draws is the operation of steam locomotives. IRM has operated a number of steamers over the years, but the mainstay engine has been Frisco 1630. This 210 type locomotive is quite popular with the public. 1630 was built in 1917 by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia and it has an interesting history. This engine was constructed as part of a 400 locomotive order made by the Imperial Russian Railways. Even today, one of the builder's plates is written in Cyrillic. The 1630 was one of 88 locomotives not shipped when the Russian Revolution occurred. She instead spent many years working on the Pennsylvania Railroad, the St. Louis-San Francisco Railroad, and the Eagle Pitcher Mining Company in Oklahoma, which donated her to the museum in 1965. By balancing the throttle, steam cut off, and air brakes, the engineer soon has the train up to speed. While the engineer is responsible for keeping the train safely in motion, the fireman is the one who actually provides the horsepower to run the locomotive. The fireman shoveling coal into the engine is an image that is fixed in the American memory. Yet many people have the mistaken notion that the locomotive develops its power from the fire. This is only half true. 
as a steam locomotive really runs because the fire boils water to make steam. the basis of our modern society. You can't build a diesel engine or a gasoline engine until you've used the technology of the steam engine to create the machinery that makes the precision that's necessary for a gasoline or diesel engine to work. The local blacksmith who shoed horses and repaired plows could fix the early steam engines. When they went off the rails, you pulled them back on again, you lose, used a t big team of horses and a lot of men, and the blacksmith straightened a few things out and it ran again. As the engines became more complicated, the machinery to fix them followed the engines across the rails, across the country, and that machinery then was in place to fix the internal combustion engine as well, when it again followed across the country. One of the truly unique things about the Illinois Railway Museum is that all operations are carried out by volunteers. This includes people that the public never sees, such as the shop workers. A steam locomotive will spend as much time under repair as it does running on the railroad. A small but dedicated contingent of volunteers spends most of the winter keeping the steam locomotives in shape. Just like the engineers and firemen, these people have learned the skills of a bygone era. The steam locomotive is an entirely different machine than the internal combustion engine that most people are familiar with. Volunteer Ed Beer takes us inside 1630 to see how the locomotive actually works. Now this is a firebox of the uh, 1630. It's about 64 square foot of area. It's about eight by eight. Look at the grates. The grates in the front half of the firebox have larger holes so they'll admit more air than in the, the rear set of grates. Normally there's brick that lay in between here. This is the arch, arch tubes and this is the siphon. And they brick this whole area off to about, back to about here. Then when the, the air is drawn through the, the coal and the fire, the fire comes up, comes back off the arch brick and around, and it gets more heat in the siphon and the arch tubes. We burn the coal, it, it, this, this entire area is surrounded with, with uh, water. You got the uh, water behind the side sheets here. The, there's water in the arch tubes and in the siphon. It completely it, around the whole entire firebox and to a depth of about four and a half inches over the highest part of the crown sheet, which is the upper sheet. After the fire is drawn around over the arch brick, it comes down through this area here and then goes into these flues. The large tubes being superheater tubes, small tubes are just a regular two-inch tube. And the fire is drawn through the, 
through to the other end of the locomotive, which we'll go around and show you how the other end works. Well, the fire's drawn through the small tubes here. In this whole area around here behind the, this is the front flue sheet. Behind the flue sheet and around the tubes is surrounded with water. And the fire's drawn through here. And then it heats the, the water. And then the, uh, these are superheater tubes here. The fire's also drawn through these big tubes here around the superheater tubes. And the steam, after it leaves the throttle, comes down into this header here and then goes into the superheater tubes and then is reheated to a higher temperature before it leaves the delivery pipes here to go to the cylinders. In essence, then, superheated steam locomotives like the 1630 work like this. The fireman keeps a fire going in the firebox. The fire then heats the water surrounding the firebox. The water is thus converted to steam. The heat from the fire then travels through a set of tubes known as flues, going the entire length of the boiler. The heat is then discharged up the smokestack. As is the case with the firebox, the flues in the boiler are surrounded by water. The heat from the fire converts the water to saturated steam, which rises to the top of the boiler and goes to the front of the locomotive. Once at the front of the engine, the steam is directed back inside the hot flues. This serves to heat the steam to a much higher temperature than the boiling point, removing moisture from it, thus making the steam more powerful. The steam then is fed into the cylinders, whose back and forth motion spins the wheels. Well, the museum steam collection started out with the uh, Klickitat Log and Lumber Number no. 5, a Shea locomotive uh, was the first one in the collection. And it's grown such that today we have 23 steam locomotives in the collection. Uh, these locomotives were obtained generally from the industrial users uh, rather than from the mainline railroads. Several of the other locomotives also were obtained out of park displays. Uh, the 265 was obtained from the city of Milwaukee when a new highway was being built through this park and it was, the highway was going right through the locomotive uh, where the locomotive sat and so they had to find a good home for it and, and gave it to uh, the museum here. Several of our larger steam locomotives are inside the buildings. Uh, they have been painted and that and in order to protect the paint jobs that are on them why uh, we've even put these larger locomotives inside the barns. The locomotives that are outside, of course, are, are waiting for the day when more barn space is erected so that they'll also be put inside. Uh, in the meantime, we continue to uh, pick at them and, and work on their visual restoration, uh, you know, sandblasting and chipping and priming and painting uh, these locomotives so that they will last, uh, you know, for future generations to see and enjoy. The museum has several interesting steam locomotives on the property. Norfolk and Western number 2050 is an example of a large articulated mallet locomotive. This 2882 engine came to the museum in 1975. Chicago, Burlington and Quincy 282 number 4963 was recently saved from a Chicago scrapyard. Grand Trunk Western 080 number 8380 was actually in service until 1981, switching scrap metal at a steel mill in Sterling, Illinois. Here comes. The operation of 1630 and other steam locomotives at IRM serves as a reminder of the time before the interstate highways, when the railroads were the primary means of inner city transportation in this country. For many people, the thought of a diesel locomotive in a railway museum is something of a paradox. The museum in Union has well over 20 examples of diesel locomotive technology. One such example is former Minneapolis, Northfield and Southern number 21. This unit was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1948. It is unique because the cab is in the middle. 
with an engine on either side of it. This locomotive is also noteworthy as the Baldwin Locomotive Works, the largest builder of steam locomotives, did not successfully make the transition to diesels and went out of business shortly after the 21 was made. popular misconception that the public has about the diesel is that they all look the same. Although they are much more standardized than the steam locomotives that they replaced, styles have indeed changed over the years. Here we see an example of a 40 Streamliner, a high hood unit of the 1950s and 60s, and an early version of today's wide cab models. This particular locomotive is a member of the Union Pacific Centennial Series, which were the largest diesels ever built. Developing over 6,000 horsepower, these engines used to race across the plains of Wyoming with mile-long freights at 70 miles per hour. It's easy to see how much longer the 6930 is than the other locomotives. Chicago and Northwestern GP7, number 1518, is the very first high hood unit built by General Motors, being built by the Electromotive Division in 1948. These models were once quite common and were very much in vogue. Today they're becoming rare and worthy of museum status. The uh, diesel collection is, uh, of course, evolving, and a lot of people think, oh, these things are too new and, and all that, and yet many of the pieces that we have here are actually, uh, you know, 30 and 40 years old already. Uh, many of the builders have gone out of business already, and somebody's got to save them, and we've said that uh, some point in time these, these things are going to be uh, just as rare as the steam engines are today. The crowning jewel of the diesel collection is not a locomotive, but an entire train, the Nebraska Zephyr. This train looks very sleek and modern, yet the train set was built in 1936. The locomotive is a relative newcomer, being built in 1940. Built for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad as the Twin City Zephyr, the train ran from Chicago to Minneapolis-St. Paul until the late 1940s, when it was reassigned to the Chicago-Omaha-Lincoln run and renamed the Nebraska Zephyr. Unlike other railroad equipment, the Nebraska Zephyr cars are permanently coupled to each other, so these railroad cars have spent their entire careers running together. The locomotive on the front of the Zephyr is also a veteran of this train. Number 9911 was built in 1940 by the Electromotive Corporation and is the only member of the E5 model remaining. This 2,000 horsepower locomotive is capable of 115 miles per hour and was used on trains all over the Burlington system, including the Nebraska Zephyr. Zephyr represents a time when travel was as much a social event as it was transportation. 
there was even a chance to have dinner in the diner. I'll have the tuna, light rye, okay. and I'd like the coleslaw, mm -hmm. and I would like a, the, the Sprite or whatever. Okay, would you like lettuce or tomato? The whole works. The whole works, okay. Even after 50 years, one word personifies this train, and that word is style. The museum was founded in 1953 by a group of rail fans. Uh, there were 10 of them that each got together and each chipped in $100 a piece to purchase the Indiana Railroad 65. 65 was an inner urban car from the vast Indiana Railroad system, and it became available in 1953. The, the uh, fellows bought this car, moved it to a foundry site in North Chicago, Illinois, where the owner of the foundry was a rail fan and sympathetic to their cause. 1954, they purchased a few more cars that were formerly with the Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company, the vast interurban system out of Milwaukee. Uh, in 1955, they purchased some Illinois terminal cars, and pretty soon the foundry yard started to fill up through the years, such that by 1964, the uh, foundry was sold and the new owners uh, were going to go through an expansion and needed the south yard and the museum had to move here to Union, Illinois. <laughs> What had started as a project to save one interurban car had grown to a collection of 43 pieces of railway equipment. The centerpiece of the museum is the depot from nearby Marengo, built in 1851. It was moved to Union in 1967. The museum at Union was built on the abandoned grade of the old Elgin and Belvedere interurban line, which had been vacant for decades. Over the years, the all-volunteer workforce at IRM has transformed the site from a cow pasture to a real working railroad. Since 1964, these dedicated people have steadily extended the museum's main line, which now runs for several miles. It is a credit to their skill and hard work that the Museum Railroad is in better shape than many branch line railroads in regular service. Yet another display that has been constructed by the volunteers at IRM is the railroad's working signal system. There are several different types of signals on the main line, from the color light system of more recent times to the semaphore from the earlier days of railroading. Even the parts of the signals that the public never sees are first-rate restorations. The main purpose of the Illinois Railway Museum is, of course, historic preservation of railway equipment. In addition to the railway equipment, of course, is we like to preserve all of the accompanying 
railway technology of the era. One of the important things that I work on is the railway signal apparatus and on the track. And we try to do that as it was done in the approximately 1925 to 1930 era. This is a typical railway signal case with many of the relays that were used back in the 1920s. Among the things that IRM practices is to designate sections of its railroad as typical of various types of railroads in the country. In this instance, we have replicated the Chicago South Shore and South Bend interurban near Gary. We've even gone to using the original catenary towers, the original catenary wire and overhead, and the original signals all from that railroad. When many people hear the term railway museum, they automatically think of the steam locomotive. Although the Illinois Railway Museum has several steamers, its oldest exhibit is something entirely different. The Illinois Railway Museum has a very large and, and varied uh, collection of electric uh, streetcars. Uh, this car that I'm on was built in 1859, and it was a horse car. It was the forerunner of the modern streetcars. As a horse car, it was uh, used in Chicago, and, and uh, it was uh, powered by one horse. The conductor uh, stood up here and uh, ran the car, and then the people came in back and, and sat in this little compartment. Now, if you come with me, we're going to make the transition from 1859 to 1936. Uh, the streetcars, as they were advancing in technology, uh, becoming much more uh, lighter in weight as well as much faster, uh, until such time as 1936 when this car was developed. This is a PCC car or a President's Conference Committee car is what that stood for. And this was the attempt by the streetcar companies to modernize their fleet after the Depression and win people back out of their cars and back into public transportation. Until the 1950s, the electric streetcar was the main source of public transit in most American cities. Although they were largely replaced by the bus, some cities still use them today. For many people, though, the streetcar is something of an oddity. Here in Union, there are a number of them that provide transportation around the grounds of the museum and educate the public about this quiet, pollution-free transportation from the past. This car, of course, is a streetcar. It ran on the city streets uh, in Chicago, uh, as well as many other cities in the country. As the cities grew, and they got further and further out from the central cities, uh, you started to be going further distances in these cars. And consequently, the uh, interurban car came on. And this is an example of an interurban car. You notice that it's a much bigger car. It's a much heavier car. Uh, it traveled greater distances. And the word interurban means, of course, between cities. Tickets, please. Tickets. Skokie Valley route to Winthrop Harbor via Skokie Racing, Kenosha, Zion, North Chicago Junction, Waukegan. Tickets, please. The interurban was a neat way to whiz between cities.
The interurban was oftentimes considered to be a stepchild to the better finance so-called steam railroads of the time. Most times these lines simply did not have the money to compete with the larger roads. The underdog, however, in many cases, is the real innovator. In the late 1930s, the rage was to make trains out of fluted stainless steel, such as the Nebraska Zephyr. The North Shore line between Chicago and Milwaukee found a much less expensive way to achieve the modern look. Look closely, for the stainless steel on this car is actually paint. Electric railroading is not confined solely to streetcars and inner urbans. There are also electric locomotives, such as this example from the Milwaukee Electric. The Chicago South Shore and South Bend Railroad, in addition to its interurban passenger service, also hauled quite a bit of freight behind powerful electric locomotives. The locomotive shown here was one of a group of three 5,000 horsepower locomotives purchased in 1949 from General Electric. They were part of a group of locomotives destined for the Soviet Union. With the advent of the Cold War, the engines were never shipped overseas. In reference to Joseph Stalin, these locomotives are sometimes referred to as Little Joes. One such unit, number 803, has found a home in Union and still runs from time to time. During the winter, the museum is closed to the public, but there is still quite a bit of activity at IRM. The shop crews are busy during the off-season, engaged in routine repairs and restoration work. The Illinois Railway Museum has gained a reputation of producing some outstanding restorations. The gleaming equipment that the public rides on during the summer in most cases did not arrive at the museum in very good condition. Basically what we have here today is uh, Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company uh, Snow Sweeper number B48. This car was built in 1926 uh, by the Milwaukee Electric Railway at their Cold Spring Shops location in Milwaukee. Um, the car basically is a snow sweeper which ran for many years through the streets of Milwaukee sweeping snow and also has um, a wing plow on each side of it where it would continue to push the snow off to the side of the streets. Um, snows in Milwaukee aren't as much as you get in uh, Montreal or Toronto or something like that, but it was significant enough for them to have a fleet of, uh, you know, over 20 snow sweepers on their roster. Uh, this car is the only Milwaukee electric snow sweeper saved, and in fact, it's basically, um, as far as we know, the only double truck snow sweeper left in the Midwest. This end has undergone some extensive restoration, um, including all new woodwork. Um, structural components behind it. What you see here is the product of uh, several years work at this end. Um, an extensive restoration project is going on right now at the other end and um, basically uh, the whole car at some point will be resided, a new floor will be put in, a new roof will be added, um, and the car at some point will be made operational. 
basically what we have here is this tongue and groove siding. This is an actual piece that was on this end. You see the thing is rotted basically beyond repair, split, cracked. It's just, you know, barely any paint left on it. It's really a piece of garbage. It's ready for the fire basically. Um, what we had to do is manufacture new tongue and groove for this end. As you can see here, here's a piece of newly milled tongue and groove. This piece um, was from stock that we had on hand. However, the original material was a little too wide. So what we did is we took this piece of tongue and groove, we measured the original width of the original piece, cut it down on the saw, came back, regrooved it to have the accurate uh, groove for the tongue and groove, put a chamfer on each side, and uh, came up with an original piece of millwork that we will use uh, throughout the car restoration. Uh, the whole car will be resided with the new tongue and groove material, and we do have an accurate piece of millwork here that's as close to the original one as we can make it. These cars, they look good with the new tongue and groove on them and all, but the main components of the cars is the structural work that's underneath. As you can see here, a lot of the structural work doesn't look the greatest. It's in bad shape, it's rusted, corroded from the salt over the years, etc. Um, but this end is nowhere near as bad as the other end is. Before any of the woodwork that looks so nice that you've seen at the other end can be done, you have to do the structural work at this end. As you can see right here, this piece structurally is beyond repair. There's nothing we can do, there's nothing that can be welded. A huge gaping hole, this is an 8-inch I-beam, that's a 20 and a half pound per foot I-beam that, uh, you know, was just totally damaged structurally from the salt damage over the years, from being outside. The car essentially was stored outside from 1926 on. And as you can see, that there's no way to save anything like this, so we had to resort to cutting out the sections and fabricating new pieces. In order to assemble all these steel pieces together, um, a system of fasteners is used. Initially, it's all fastened together with bolts. However, the permanent fastener becomes the rivet. Rivet essentially is a basic piece of steel that's heated and formed on the other side to form a permanent fastener, almost as a well does today. During the time when these things were built, rivets were commonly used in all types of constructions from bridges to buildings to railroad cars. As you can see here, every hole will eventually be filled with a rivet. The rivet's process is basically pretty simple. The rivet is heated to approximately 1800 degrees, held in place by one side by a bucking tool, and on the other side it's pounded over by a driving tool. The initial process for riveting is to drill the hole to approximately the size that you need. And these are basically all 5 8 rivets. Initial hole of 5 8 is drilled, however, a rivet expands when it's heated. It then becomes larger, so therefore the hole must be reamed to size. This is a reaming tool here. It's an air-operated tool. It runs at a high revolution speed, and basically each hole is reamed to have a consistent fit throughout that hole. The next part that's done, after the rivet is heated, it's inserted through the hole, held in place by a snap here, which is called, which is held by a bucking tool underneath. That's held on that side. Once that's held in place, a driving tool is used to pound over the rivet and form the same type head on the opposite side, thus leaving a permanent fastener. We have a one of our uh, Chicago streetcar projects here. Uh, it was started in 1984. The car was uh, part of an order of streetcars that the Chicago Surface Lines took delivery of in 1922. There were 179 cars. These cars operated in regular service along Broadway and State Street, and later, after the war, uh, were converted to one-man use uh, and used on smaller lines prior to uh, these lines being changed to motor bus. The car operated till about 1953 when it was taken out of service with the remaining portion of this group of cars. Uh, this car, 3142, was saved and eventually came out to our museum with a group of Chicago streetcars. We selected this car for uh, restoration purposes because of its uh, historical significance on our Chicago streetcar collection. It represents uh, the streetcars that are not here or not saved that were built between the, the 20s and the, and the early 1940s. Well, this is the, uh, this is the new floor which we finished um, with the trap doors and the groove center, uh, identical to the old floor. Uh, the seats here 
were put in brand new. The seat frames for the nickel, for the longitudinal seating, there's four se sections to it, were remanufactured from pictures because they were missing from the car. And uh, my partner, Paul Lewandowski, did this on his own time, both at home and here on the property. We'll, we'll put cu new cushions in with new rattan and go down the line. The level of restoration on this car is so exacting that the museum went to Alexandria, Egypt to obtain the correct electric traction motors. One of the most convincing illusions to be found at IRM is the 50th Avenue Chicago Transit Authority elevated station. This structure, built in 1910, was formerly located in Cicero, Illinois, and was trucked here to Union. It's an example of the museum's goal to recreate authentic railroad environments rather than to just run trains. Well, you're uh, looking at the 50th Avenue station that was located on the Douglas Park Rapid Transit line. Uh, 50th Avenue was in Cicero, Illinois, and this was a station on this rapid transit line that uh, saw a lot of heavy usage uh, back in the old days. It was built in 1910, and uh, the museum took it apart and moved it piece by piece uh, here to our site, uh, only because we have a, a large rapid transit collection, and in order for the visiting public to get the feel of what it was like to ride rapid transit cars, we thought that an authentic rapid transit station was also necessary. Many of the things that we do here are not just strictly trains, but we're trying to put it into a sociological context. And uh, people rode these things day in and day out to go to work. Uh, in the case of the 50th Avenue station, uh, it served the Western Electric plant in Cicero, Illinois. And that was the largest plant in the United States at one time, manufacturing telephone equipment. And thousands of people a day used to go through this station uh, going to and from work. That's the type of thing that we're trying to depict here at the museum to give the feel to the people when they do ride our, our rapid transit cars and interurban cars of what it was like to do that. The train that has just arrived at 50th Avenue is perhaps one of the most celebrated trains in the country, the Electroliner. The museum has spent over $100,000 restoring what many consider to be the finest interurban train ever built. The Electroliner, which is part of the North Shore Line. Uh, this particular train was built in 1941 by the St. Louis Car Company. It was used in their interurban service between Chicago and Milwaukee uh, through limited stops. The uh, train was capable of speeds upwards of 80 miles an hour. It was their main mainstay equipment. There were two trains that did five runs a day from Chicago to Milwaukee. <laughs> It uh, was the epitome of design for an interurban company. Uh, prior to that, the company had pretty much standard cars and, and standard looking cars, but uh, uh, the automobile age was coming on then, and the, uh, the interurban companies as well as the streetcar companies were losing customers. Uh, people were uh, taking to their cars because of the convenience of the cars and how they were modern. Well, the Electroliner was their answer, the car builder's answer, as well as the North Shore Line's answer to modernization of railroad equipment. In 1941, when it was built, it was built uh, to be sleek and modern looking. It's still pretty sleek and modern looking today. Uh, it was all air conditioned and it was uh, soundproofed and a high speed train with its own dining car compartment. It was the sharpest thing running in those days. Everybody that looked at it 
we pull up, we're out of Chicago, we use the elevated line, and everybody is just staring, look at it, because we were the only ones air conditioned on top of it. And it was a really, really sharp looking train. If the Electroliner was introduced today, many would consider its design to be very modern. That's not bad for a train that is 50 years old. The trains showcased in this tape are but a sampling of the collection that is housed in Union. One of the major attractions of IRM is that visitors can come year after year and chances are that there will be something new to see. One thing that never changes, however, is the opportunity to briefly step back in time before freeways and jumbo jets when getting there meant jumping aboard the next inner urban and the steam locomotive ruled the countryside.